it is sometimes said that all we need is the Novus Ordo Mass as promulgated. But a closer look reveals that what Paul VI promulgated was an act of rupture. And Joseph Ratzker, in his work as Cardinal, Bishop, and Pope, worked to recover the continuity within the principle of tradition, which vindicates the trads. Brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus in Sequila. This is Timothy Flanders with the meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Welcome to Pope Benedict Vindicates the Trads. This is a series, series for trads discussing the work of Pope Benedict and discussing how his principles of action and some of his missteps or blind spots help to vindicate the modern traditionalist movement. The views expressed on this show may not adhere to the views of the hosts on uh, other hosts on meaning of Catholic. Uh, so let's continue, continue our series. This is part 19. If you look at the show notes, we'll have all the parts listed there. We're going to continue to talk about the liturgical aspects of Pope Benedict, because this is where Pope Benedict really shines out and vindicates the principles that undergird the liturgical adherence to tradition of the trad movement. Last week, we talked about the suppression of the Latin Mass, and we talked about how Joseph Ratzinger called that something that was against the spirit of the church. And by do it, by returning the Latin Mass to its full rights, he was implementing continuity. Today, we'll talk about Latin and Gregorian chant, one of the most ex conspicuous aspects of the liturgical celebration. So before we get into that, I just want to ask all of you if you've benefited from this show, the show is offered for free without ads on YouTube, and but it is not free to produce, and we need your support with the Guild. That's at patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic. You can also contact us. If you can't afford it, you can always get con get uh, access to it for free if you can't afford it. Uh, but we do ask your, for your support to continue this show and this apostolate, and you can get, give that support at patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic. So let's get into our topic. So the, the Sacrosanctum Concilium, Vatican II, the liturgical uh, document of Vatican II, promulgated in its text, mentions certain things regarding Gregorian chant and Latin. It says that Latin must be retained, and it says that Gregorian chant should have pride of place. And these are things that are often quoted to say, well, this is what we should have in the Novus Ordo. And this would allow us to have continuity. We should we can have a reverent Novus Ordo. We can have all these things. And then we would have a good liturgy. But the problem with that is that Paul VI implementation of that document and his promulgation of that included actually the loss of Gregorian chant and the loss of Latin. So we'll get into that. Uh, what we need to understand is that Paul VI, the Pope, is he's the promulgator of Vatican II. So his interpretation carries a great deal of weight about what the actual promulgation of that thing. And we'll talk about how the, the principles of recognize and resist evoke a higher principle for receiving Vatican II and receiving the liturgical reform, understanding it. And Ratzinger is the one who who invokes this higher principle to try to correct some of the mess that was created by this implementation. So I'm going to go through a few documents here. We've got um, first the first interesting thing is that when in 1964, this is from a uh, new liturgical movement. Paul VI was once in favor of Sacrosanctum Concilium. So this is from 1964, and when Paul VI basically just repeats what the council said uh, in, in 1964 in a, an address to French pilgrims says that Gregorian chant is not in any danger. And he quotes the, the um, Sacrosanctum Concilium, the treasury of sacred music is to be preserved and fostered with great care. Now what's interesting though, is that by 1966, 
he is making an address to the Benedictines of Rome. And in this address, which is quoted in the monastic diurnal published by St. Michael's Abbey, in this address, he says that the church is now going to promote vernacular. But you, he says, speaking to the monastics, you must preserve Gregorian chant. So now we have uh, this concept that appears to be that Paul VI is not wanting to preserve Gregorian chant in the parish level, but rather on the monastic level. Now, what happens is that in 1967, the promulgated instruction on sacred music called Musicam Sacrum, that itself is a reflection of this evolution of the promulgation of Sacrosanctum Concilium. Because after Sacrosanctum Concilium was promulgated by Paul VI, there was initiated a, a great struggle between all the institutions in Rome and elsewhere which promoted sacred music, Gorgorian chant, and polyphony. And then the promoters of sort of vernacularized popular church music. And as we, not surprising at all, the promoter of the vernacular popular music was none other than Archbishop Bunini. And he was pushing for a more and more and more desacralization and vernacularization in the name of the active participation of the faithful, which is a key principle of the document. And we'll get back into Joseph Rasker, how he understands that differently. But Bunini takes active participation to mean external participation only, meaning the faithful are singing because the more Gregorian chant you have, the more you know difficult polyphony you have, the less the faithful are going to be able to sing that because it's difficult, obviously. Um, so this Musicum Sacrum instruction comes out in 1967, and that's another promulgated act of Paul VI under his pontificate. And I'm going to read from Chiron's biography of Bunini here. This is on page 160, and it says this. The very notion of sacred music had a breadth that was not to be found in the constitution of the liturgy. So Musicum Sacrum actually expands the definition of sacred music. Now, here's, here's the definition in paragraph 4b of Musicum Sacrum. Quote, the term sacred music here includes Gregorian chant, the several styles of polyphony, both ancient and modern, sacred music for organ and for other penitent instruments, and the sacred, i.e. liturgical and religious music of the people. End quote. So Musicum Sacrum is actually expanding sacred music to mean these sort of popular vernacularized music. Uh, now, listen to this. The entrance, offertory, and communion chants provided for in the graduale may be replaced with other songs if, quote, the competent territorial authority, end quote, i.e. the bishops, permits it. That's Musicum Sacrum, um, paragraph 32. While the instruction does not rule out the use of Latin and Gregorian chant, it does limit them, in fact, to a few places by way of concession, as it were, in paragraph 48, quote, again, from Musicum Sacrum. Once the vernacular has been introduced into the mass, local ordinaries should determine whether it is advisable to retain one or more masses in Latin, particularly sung masses. This applies especially to great cities and churches with a large attendance of faithful using foreign language. So we already see a massive shift from Sacrosanct and Concilium. Um, I believe it was promulgated in 63, but it was one of the first documents promulgated at Vatican II. And by 1967, what is instructed so in, in Sacrosanctum and Concilium, there's Gregorian chant and Latin is retained, pride of place, must be reserved, and we'll, we can make concessions to the vernacular. By 67, it's actually reversed. Now we have the main vernacular, popular songs are replacing all of the parts of the mass, and we might give you one or two Latin masses. Uh, you know, the, the competent authority should determine whether it's advisable to retain one or more masses in Latin. That's a remarkable shift already in 1967. So let's continue. Um, what happens next is uh, 1969. So on the lead up, now we've had, there was already the Novus Ordo was uh, celebrated for the Synod of Bishops. The Synod of Bishops did not approve the Novus Ordo in its, in its state as it was celebrated in 1967. There was a, it was kind of a more or less a third and a third and a third. A third approved it as is, another third approved it, but, but with wanted changes, and then another third uh, did not approve it as it is. Um, so the ultimately in 67, the Synod of Bishops did not give their full approval. 
the majority was not giving their full approval to the mass as it was. But nevertheless, it was pushed through because Bunini pushed it and Paul VI backed him up. And so 1969 comes along and it's it's the going into the fall, uh, the promulgation of uh, the actual Novus Ordo Mise. So here, the, I'm going to quote here from the general audience of Paul VI in November 26, 1969. So this right here is, this I think can be considered as the promulgating words of Sacrosanctum Concilium. This is, so this is right before the new mass comes into play here. So these, these words are the words of the promulgator of Vatican II, who is now promulgating the new mass. And notice what he says here, and we're going to concentrate contrast what how, how Joseph Ratzinger sees this. So take a look at uh take a look at these these words from Paul VI. He says this: it is Christ's will, it is the breath of the Holy Spirit which calls the church to make this change, the new mass. A prophetic moment is, is occurring in the mystical body of Christ, which is the church. This moment is shaking the church, arousing it, obliging it to renew the mysterious art of its prayer. Now, notice what he says here. He's couching everything on obedience to the council, to the Holy Spirit. But notice what he says here. This is Paul VI. It is here that the greatest newness is going to be noticed, the newness of language. No longer Latin, but the spoken language will be the principal language of the Mass. The introduction of the vernacular will certainly be a great sacrifice for those who know the beauty, the power, and the expressive sacrality of Latin. We are parting with the speech of the Christian centuries. We are becoming like profane intruders in the literary pres preserve of sacred utterance. We will lose a great part of that stupendous and incomparable artistic and spiritual thing, the Gregorian chant. We will lose Gregorian chant. We have reason indeed to regret. Reason almost for bewilderment. What can we put in the place of that language of the angels? We are we are giving up something of priceless worth, but why? What is more precious than these loftiest of church's values? Now notice what he says here. Now he's going to bring in his principles of promulgation. And notice how he defines this. Notice here, continuing the quote here from Paul VI. The answer will seem banal, prosaic, yet it is a good answer because it is, it is human, because it is apostolic. Understanding of prayer is worth more than the silken garments in which it is royally dressed. Participation by the people is worth more, particularly participation by modern people so fond of plain language, which is easily understood and converted into everyday speech, end quote. So here we have Paul VI's promulgating address, which says, the conspicuous things about the Novus Ordo today. There's no Latin and there's no Gregorian chant. So if you have a Novus Ordo that's without Latin and without Gregorian chant, that is in line with the promulgating address of Paul VI. So it's not as simple just to say, hey, we should have a Novus Ordo as promulgated because the promulgation of the Novus Ordo included these words. But notice how he defines active participation. He defines it as external participation, understanding, rational understanding. You have to understand the words. He, he excludes the, the participation of the heart in beauty, the participation of the heart in beauty, which we'll get back to. This is what Joseph Ratzker is going to emphasize later because Gregorian chant beauty itself, beauty itself reflects the divine and it moves the heart to the divine glory, even without a rational understanding of what the words are saying. That's what beauty does. And so there is, is actually an active participation in the beauty, even if you're rationally not understanding what the words mean, but not according to Paul VI. Paul VI is saying we need to have an understanding. That is the narrow understanding of what active participation is. Now, what's really interesting is that he couches this as obedience to the council. Whereas before, 1964, he seemed to appear to preserve Gregorian chant in obedience to the council. Now he seems to be in obedience to the council, removing Gregorian chant, removing Latin. So we have this divide within Paul VI, and this is why the, um, the, the I think it's the newest biography of 
uh, Paul VI by Yves Chiron is called The Divided Pope, which seems to express how Paul VI really went back and forth and he waffled on these things. And so what's really interesting is that after the promulgation, so there's also another shift which seems to take place because in 1973, Paul VI addresses, has three addresses in which he emphasizes Gregory, he emphasizes chant. Uh, now this is contained in this this document or this uh, this text here. This is um, Vatican II, Volume One, the Conciliar and Postconciliar Documents, edited by Austin Flannery, New Revised Edition, and uh, this contains an interesting um, an interesting letter from 1974. Let me just. I didn't have this page ready here. So in this, um, uh, 273, where is this? Here we go. Okay. So this references um, the fact that uh, a letter is sent to all the bishops by Paul VI um, where he gives them this Latin Gregorian chant repertoire, which is known as Misa Jubilate Deo. And Misa Jubilate Deo is some of the most well-known settings of the Gregorian chant for the four parts of the Mass, the Kyrie, the Gloria, uh, actually, the including the Credo, actually, but the Sanctus and the Agnus Dei. So it, he's actually, now, now in 1974, Paul VI is sending this repertoire to all the bishops of the world and saying you should use this as your minimum chant repertoire. Where did this come from? But it references this. This is the 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 letter itself from 14th of April 1974. Uh, this was done in response, quoting the letter, to a desire which the Holy Father had frequently expressed that all the faithful should know at least some Latin Gregorian chants, such as the Gloria, as I said. And then it references an address, three addresses from 1973. Now, if anyone can explain this a little bit more, besides just Paul being a weak waffler, unfortunately, um, I, I mean, I like to believe that in the 1970s, Paul VI was repenting and trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube, as we say in America, which I, I hope that was the case because there were, as we said, there were people like Joseph Ratzinger who were publicly critiquing Paul VI and his liturgical reform in the 1970s. And this was in the 1973 also came his famous uh, smoke of Satan speech, which uh, Monsignor Noe says that that was actually in reference to in in part, at least to the liturgical reform. We know through Monsignor Noe as well that there were various aspects of the liturgical reform that Paul VI did not like that he actually discovered as he was celebrating the new mass. He discovered it and he realized that he didn't like it. He couldn't he couldn't believe that they'd taken out these references to sin and expiation from the mass of the dead, for example. He couldn't believe that they'd taken out the uh, vesting prayers. Um, and this is all from the um, the anecdotes of, of Monsignor Noe. Let's see here. Oh, no. Paul's just like. I, so this is a new liturgical movement if you go to here. So so the um, Virg, uh, Virgilio Cardinal Noe who was the papal master of ceremonies. And it, and it discusses how, uh, so this is a reference from 1971. Paul VI commented, how on earth in the liturgy of the dead should there be no more mention of sin and expiation? And then he talks about how he continued to do his vesting prayers even after they were removed. Uh, I remember another story where on Monday, the Monday of the octave of Pentecost, Paul VI went into his vesting, uh, his, his, his vestments and got out the red vestments for Monday of the octave of Pentecost. And, uh, and the, the Monsignor said, no, actually, uh, your holiness, you abolished the octave of Pentecost. And he was, you know, flabbergasted. And there's, there's m many anecdotes, which, which indicate that Paul VI actually did not even, uh, review thoroughly review the liturgical reform that he promulgated. So, whether that whether the shift in 1974 is an indication of just his weak waffling, whether it's an indication of his true repentance, realizing what he had done, trying to correct it, whether he's responding to critics like Joseph Ratzinger, it's not clear. If anybody has research in that area, please contact me so we can fill in the blanks here. But 
what is interesting is this this shift that happens 1974 so he sends out misa Ubalate deo as the minimum chant repertoire now let's contrast all these comments with joseph Gratzinger. first let me let me get to some of your questions here um let me see john says the implementation did the opposite of what sacrosanctum laid down regarding chant that applies with much of the profane liturgical reform right um that's that's exactly the point but the problem is that the pope is the implementer of the council who who has more authority the pope or the council obviously the pope but so paul the six contradicts the council and suppresses latin mass and and or the latin and gregorian chant is in his promulgating address so the only way around that is for joseph ratzker to to invoke an even higher principle than both the council and the pope and what is that principle tradition that is the principle of the principle of tradition which finds its acute conspicuousness in continuity as cardinal Seurat said when he condemned transcendentalist custodes he said the church's only legitimacy is her consistency and continuity and that's the principle of tradition so um let me see just a minute So I just had some very zealous commentators in the background needed to uh, get their comment. Um, let me see. Why did D says, why did Paul the sick back up Bunini? What he was, he actually that naive. Uh, it appears that yes, uh, he, he was in fact that naive. Uh, it, it appears Um from all appearances, based on the memoirs of Louis Bouillet, who worked on the Concilium, Bunini was a very, very skilled manipulator who was able to lie, lie, cheat, and steal basically his way to manipulate Paul VI. Paul VI was a very manipulatable person, apparently, very influenced by people with strong personality like, like Bunini. Um, and so that is, appears to be, have been what happened is that Bunini manipulated him, but to his credit, Paul VI eventually sacked Bunini in 1975. Um, you know, we can also say to his credit that the general instruction for the Roman Missal, when there was that recognize and resist by Cardinal Taviani, Paul VI did respond positively to that, and he changed the general instruction to be more Catholic and less heretical. Good. Um, so... Yes, it does appear that he was either naive and and unfortunately, you know, in fairness, there are other instances of popes believe, you know, getting a bad report, you know, Pius the Pius the 11th um silenced Padre Pio for crying out loud. Obviously, I and mean, he betrayed the Cristeros for crying out loud. So, uh, you know, papal naivete or papal uh, you know, bad counsel going through the bureaucracy is nothing new. But it does seem to be particularly uh acute with paul the six um that he was in in fact quite naive unfortunately but to his credit he seems to at least he seems to have uh tried to come back from a lot of that in the 1970s um love of wisdom says father z argues the novus order is not law because of consistent unacceptance by the church widespread abuses imply this various indults for the tlm apply this uh yes of course um I mean, I would agree. I would agree very much with Father Z. I'm I'm simply saying that Paul the Six nevertheless said it is a law. His very words were, "It is a law." Uh, but Benedict invokes the higher tr the higher principle of tradition, and um, which we we're trying to say that Pope Benedict's right in this case here, you know, and that's what vindicates the trats. Um, let me see. I was just seeing. Um, It would be interesting to document and compile all the resistance, lack of acceptance of this. 
Right. Um, that's what we're trying to do a little bit with this uh, with this series. But um, let's let's get into some of the quotes from Joseph Ratzinger, which which where he he actually invokes a higher tradition or a higher principle, which is tradition, which trumps both the pope and the council and provides the framework within which we we can the only framework, which is the hermeneutic of continuity. Now, I know trads have a problem with that. Um, you know, be, if we were to take that hermeneutic of continuity and say, well, all you got to do is hermeneutic of continuity, and then we've solved all the problems. That would be too much. But if we at least say hermeneutic of continuity is basically the principle of the binding force of tradition, it's that the church's only legitimacy is her consistency and continuity. The, the council, whether it's the council rupturing or the pope rupturing, no one has the authority to do that because their their own authority is given to them to safeguard the deposit of faith, safeguard the tradition. So, uh, so you can't, you just can't, you, you just can't do anything outside of that whole framework. So, um, this this is the whole framework. It, it, so, there are limits to hermeneutic continuity. Obviously, uh, it doesn't solve all the problems. But what what Ratzker is trying to say is that that's really the only hermeneutic that counts. That's the only hermeneutic that, that, that uh, is worth anything because it's the principle of tradition. Um, Clint says, how does quo primum play out in all of this? And that's, that's a great question because that was what Archbishop Lefebvre in evaluating this, it did not seem to explicitly contradict and, and abrogate quo primum. So there seemed to be no basis for saying that the old mass was truly abrogated. And that's why Sumerum Pontificum says exactly that, that it was never technically abrogated and was in principle always allowed. So let me get in, uh, let me get into the, the Paul, the, the um, let's see. Here's, um, first of all, this is the address from 1998 that we quoted from Joseph Ratzinger uh, last week. This is where he talks about how suppressing the old mass is against the spirit of, of the church. Um, so he, he says, um, so here is where Joseph Rassiger continues his, his sort of correction of the rupture of Paul the six without mentioning Paul the six. So remember we talked about how this was, this is the whole principle of recognize and resist is that there is a higher authority called tradition. Tradition is the one authority in the church and all ecclesiastical authorities are given their their own power and authority is given to them to guard tradition. And so even if they try to make a rupture, that rupture is null and void. That rupt the authority of that rupture is null and void. And Ratzinger attempts to invoke tradition and then create the framework wherein Sacrosanctum Concilium can only be implemented with continuity and with tradition. That's the only way it can be done. And so he, he says in this address, the actual constitution on the liturgy does not speak at all about celebrating faith in the altar of people. We'll, we'll, we'll cover that in another show. On the subject of language, it says that Latin should be retained while giving a greater place to the vernacular above all in readings, instructions, and a certain number of prayers and chants. So this is making reference to the fact that the, the actual document has Gregorian chant and Latin, our pride of place should be retained. And then there's a concession to vernacular. So he's, he's, he's passing over Paul the sixth's promulgation. He's passing over Sacrum Santum or um, music on Sacrum of 1967 that we quoted from. And he's going back to the text of Sacrum Santum Concilium, but adding this hermeneutic of the, the hermeneutical principle of tradition. And all of this, we need to see that this is a, this is an act of recognize and resist. He's not just blindly following Paul VI promulgated. He's saying, no, no, we have to we have to interpret Vatican II with the continuity of tradition. That's the only way we can do it because the council itself does not have authority to make a rupture, much less the Pope. So here is the next. Um, here's the next quote, which is even stronger than the first. Um, so this is from a, a great article, and this is really you could. You can mine this whole thing for all sorts of vindication of the trads. This is the best quotes on the liturgy by Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict the Sixteenth. Okay, so if we go to uh, let's see, Feast of Faith. 
this is from the Feast of Faith Approaches to the Theology of the Liturgy, 1986. Okay, so here's the quote I want to highlight here. Uh, highlight. There we go. Okay, so here, here's what here's what the quote says from Ratzinger. In part, it is simply a fact that the council was pushed aside. For instance, it had said that the language of the Latin rite was to remain Latin although suitable scope might be given to the vernacular. Today, we might ask, is there a Latin rite any, all, at all anymore? Certainly, there was no awareness of it. Page 84. Now, when we look at, we compare this to Paul VI, we see how, how this is a complete act of recognize and resist here, because he's completely resisting what Paul VI promulgated. He's resisting these, this, uh, you know, Paul VI said Latin, or said that, Vernacular will be the principal language. Now, I finally, I want to read from, um, let's see. I want to read from, uh, where is this? Okay. Read from this text, which we've referenced a few times, Collected Works on the Theology of the Liturgy. And in this text, it's very interesting. So if you if you go to page, uh, go to, that, to the beginning of this section, page 421 begins to talk about sacred music. And he contrasts a commentary on Vatican II, which was written by Karl Rahner and Herbert Vorgrimler, and how they say that sacred music or Gregorian chant should be basically relegated to cathedrals or monasteries, but the common voice of the people should be what's called what he calls utility music. Now, this is exactly in line with what Paul VI said in his promulgating address. So, what does, what does Joseph Ratzker say in response to this? Um, he says that this needs to be resolved with the principle of the liturgy, or a principle of the, of the tradition. Um, now, he says there is a definite tension within the council document. Now, Bunini put that tension in there, as we know, if we, if we, this is what quoted in the Master of the Ages documentary, but it, it's from one of his, his design meetings when he wrote the, the schema on the liturgy and that he, he meant to put ambiguities in it in order to push things later on. Um, Joseph Grasser points out the Gregorian chant is particularly recommended, but there is also an express affirmation of polyphony. And then he says, there needs to be all of these introductions and these concessions to innovations, which he admits, you know, there is a concession to vernacular, there's a concession to other musical instruments, uh, songs of the people, but they need to be implemented on, quote, the conditions formulated by tradition. The conditions formulated by tradition. That is the principle of the trads. Page 423, Rassiger again, the years that followed the, Vatican II witnessed the increasingly grim impoverishment that follows when beauty for its own sake is banished from the church and all is subordinated to the principle of utility. One shudders at the lackluster face of the post-conciliary liturgy as it has become, or one is bored with its banality and its lack of artistic standards. Now notice the principle of utility was precisely the principle that helped to define Paul VI's understanding of active participation. Music is about utility. Music, the purpose of utility, the purpose of music is to help to, you need to use music in order to understand and to participate. That's the, the principle of utility, which Ratzinger is saying creates ugly music. And this is also what, uh, you know, creates ugly architecture because, you know, all these, you know, flying buttresses and uh, ornamentation and, you know, I, I remember learning on in my um, in college how there are actually inscriptions and works of art on the tops of cathedrals. And no one would ever see these except God, because the people who were making them were making beauty for God. And it, so it had no utility. It had you no know, utility for man. Beauty itself is something, as, as Plato said, it's something when, when you experience beauty, the soul grows wings. And that is what beauty is. So we'll, I'm going to read an extensive quote here from Ratzker on beauty. But note here, page, page 440, he says this about 
active participation. Active participation has been fatally narrowed down, giving the impression that active participation is only present where there is evidence of external activity, speaking, singing, preaching, liturgical action. That's exactly the principle that Paul VI said in his promulgating address. Yet, he notes, using the principle of tradition again, Article 30 of the Constitution also speaks of silence as a mood of active participation. We must go on to say that listening, the receptive employment of the senses and the mind, spiritual participation, are surely just as much activity as speaking is. Are receptivity, perception, being moved, not active things too? So this is something that he talks about in Spirit of the Liturgy, but he talks about how active participation is primarily about the action of God. God is the one who is acting, and we are participating in his action. That is the real fullest definition of active participation, which then takes various forms in terms of what you actually do, whether that's external or internal. But he's broadening this definition of active participation according to tradition, not according to the promulgated words of Paul VI or the principles given, or the principles of Brunini, for that matter. Now, here's a, here's a long quote, but I think it's very worth it because he talks about beauty here. And this is where we get the principles, really, as to why Gregorian chant should have pride of place. Even if people can't understand it, this is something that Joseph, Joseph uh, Shaw Set, he talked about it in the Mass of the Ages documentary because he makes reference to when St. Thomas asked the, asked the question, should, should we chant such and such in Latin if, even if people can't understand? And St. Thomas says, yes, we should because it invokes devotion. It, it provokes devotion. It, it provokes the heart to pray, to offer worship to God, even if the mind can't understand what the words are being said. It still invokes devotion. And that is the principle of the liturgy, which is the adoration of God above all else. So let me let me read this quote and then we will get to your questions, and then we'll be we'll be all done. <clears throat> so this is uh, Joseph Rasker, page 440 on the complete works. A church that only makes use of utility music has fallen for what is, in fact, useless. She too becomes ineffectual, for her mission is a far higher one. As the Old Testament speaks of the temple, the church is to be the place of glory, and as such too, the place where mankind's cry of distress is brought to the ear of God. The church must not settle down with what is merely comfortable and serviceable at the parish level. She must arouse the voice of the cosmos, and by glorifying the Creator, elicit the glory of the cosmos itself, making it also glorious, beautiful, habitable, and beloved. Next to the saints, the art that the church has produced is the only real apologia for her history. It is this glory which witnesses to the Lord, not theology's clever explanations for all the terrible things that lamentably fill the pages of her history. The church is to transform, improve, humanize the word, world, but how can she do that if at the same time she turns her back on the beauty which is so closely, closely allied to love? For together, beauty and love form the true consolation in this world, bringing it as near as possible to the world of the resurrection. The church must maintain high standards. She must be a place where beauty can be at home. She must lead the struggle for that spiritualization without which the world becomes the first circle of hell. Thus, to ask what is suitable must always be the same as asking what is worthy. It must constantly challenge us to seek what is worthy of the church's worship. And this is ultimately the this fundamental principle, which we've quoted before from Dietrich von Hildebrand, going back all the way to 1933, the same principle of Archbishop Lefebvre, which is that the liturgy, the, the whole purpose of the liturgy is the adoration of the divine majesty. So when we speak about what is worthy the fittingness of a given piece of music, we have to say, is that is that worthy of offering to the divine majesty? Because in worshiping, in, in offering this, this offering of beauty, it is uh, something that is worthy of divine majesty. 
And by offering the liturgy in that way, that's when the active participation of the faithful can be truly fruitful. Because when the liturgy is turned into all uh, just a utility for man, then the liturgy becomes ugly. It becomes useless. I love what he says here. The church that only makes use of utility music has fallen for what is, in fact, useless. I think that that very powerfully explains how this ugliness comes about. Is It's the idea that the liturgy is all about a utility for man. And that's what Dietrich von Hildebrand predicted back in 1933. As soon as the liturgy is turned into this catechetical exercise of transforming man, it can no longer transform man. So that is our show today. Let me get to your questions here. Um, let's see. Going back to hermeneutic continuity is tradition. There's no reason to think there's some sort of Hegelian dialectic going on. It is our tradition. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you meant precisely by that, but um, yes, there's the tradition is the the true growth of tradition is not Hegel takes a half truth out of the church's history and play places. As far as I know, um, this synthesis, antithesis, um, and thesis and all this. Um, but there can be no synthesis unless it is grounded in tradition, which follows the same type and a, and a true development of doctrine. Um, let me see. Peter says, seems Ratzinger was quite traditional and rigid. Um, that is certainly an aspect of this, which we're trying to get at with um, this whole series. Uh, Gabriel says, if you're calling for undoing Vatican II, you are invalidating that the church is inerrant. I'm not sure exactly the full breadth of what your comment is here, brother. Um, but I would I would point to another quote from Joseph Ratzinger, where Joseph Gratzinger says that some councils proved to be a waste of time. That's a Joseph Ratzinger speaking. Some councils proved to be a waste of time. And he notes Lateran 5. So when all the people after Lateran 5 said, hey, we need to have the Council of, Council of Trent. We need to do something new. Let's forget about Lateran 5. Let's do something new. Were those people invalidating the church or saying that the church is not inerrant because they were going to pass over Lateran 5? No, they were just reading the signs of the times. So trads are saying, hey, even if we put the best interpretation of Vatican II, ultimately, the one, the world rejected the offer, offer of dialogue. Church came out and said, hey, let's dialogue. The world said, no, we don't want to do that. And they've destroyed the world ever since. So just saying, hey, let's move on from dialogue because the world wasn't interested is not saying that the church is you know, in error. Uh, another aspect is that the second sexual revolution of the later 1960s, that's a problem that arose after the council. So how can the, even the count, even if the council was perfect, how could the council address a situation that arose after the council? It can't preemptively address a situation that arises later. So, I mean, those are just some of the aspects of, of the trad critique of Vatican II. Um, Traditional Thomas says, so much of the crisis in the post-conciliar time comes down to language. With the Nouvelle Théologie desire to toss scholastic language, we ended up with an ambiguous council and liturgical confusion. Uh, yes, I, I quite agree. This was in Humani Generis was in 1950, was where Pius XII said that we cannot cast off scholastic language. We cannot cast it off, but that's exactly what happened. Now, to be fair, the pastoral language, so-called pastoral language of Vatican II has a precedent in the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent used a new form of language to combat Protestants in particular. So the, the, if you compare Council of Trent to the language of you know, all these prior councils, it's a lot different. And that's because they're trying to refute Protestantism. So there can be new language, but what uh, Trad Thomas is getting at here is that there are these ambiguities that are introduced, and we've covered these before on this series, um, because even though you could use new language in theory, ultimately there are these ambiguities introduced in certain areas. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Yes, D says, reading Pope Benedict makes one realize that what an enlightened and intelligent mind he has. Yeah, so this is, I mean, I started this series actually because we had Pope Benedict Appreciation Month back in February, but we there was a bunch of negative trad comments. And I, and I thought, well, that's that's just sad because I think that Pope Benedict vindicates the trads in many ways. And that's this pur whole purpose of this series. Now, that doesn't mean Pope Benedict was right on every single point, obviously, but he's a friend of the trads. And I think I think that's a, something that we've um, we we should we should get back to. Um, uh, friend uh, on Chipital over in the Netherlands says, "Knowing what the Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, Sanctum, and Agnus Dei mean is an essential part of catechesis. It's not that hard to learn." Yeah, great, great point. And I and I mean that's <clears throat> the basics of the Mass. I mean, people knew these things. People knew enough Latin to understand some of the basics of all this, you know, the pater noster. Um, and, but it's interesting. So, I mean, the liturgy was very much a bilingual thing because there were private devotions in the vernacular, but there's also a lot of Latin and, and people would just know the Latin, a lot of the Latin, not all, but um, so some of this basic stuff, you know, people know that absolutely. Um, let me see. So what can the lady, okay, Mary says, what can the lady do realistically to promote a return to tradition when so many of the hierarchy are indifferent for so many different reasons? Well, um, I, I think that, yeah, there, I mean, first of all, there are things beyond our control. You know, we can't, we can't force the priest to stop communion in the hand or whatever, but we can, we can petition the bishops as much as possible. We can protest, we can make our voices heard because we are the parents and we have to form our children in the dogma of the real presence. So we have a right to a reverent liturgy. We have a right to the true sacredness of the blessed sacrament because we have a duty before God to form our children in that. I don't want to bring my children to some sacrilegious mass or, you know, communion in the hand and all this nonsense and banal music because that's going to deform their faith. That's that's a that's a certain child abuse. So we have a right to fight, fight with bishops and priests if necessary for the sake of our children. So, you know, people say like the lady, you know, <laughs> you should get out of this. But I mean, the laity have been fighting since 1964. Una Voce was a lay organization founded in 1964 to promote the Latin Mass, and it's by lay people. Lay people have been fighting with the clerics since the, since the 60s for the Latin Mass. So, one, we need to fight. But we do still have the domestic church, and the domestic church is our domain. And we can form our children uh, through all sorts of various means in the liturgy, even if the priests are promoting sacrilege and iconoclasm. Because we can teach them Gregorian chant. We can play sacred music. We can play Gregorian chant. We can play polyphony for them in the, in the domestic church. We can establish customs. This is something we've published at 1 Peter 5, the forgotten customs of all these liturgical festivals. You know, when when my son, uh, one of my favorite customs is beating up the Satan piñata for Michaelmas. We've got Michaelmas is coming up next month. So you can build a Satan piñata, beat up the beat up the Satan <laughs> piñata uh, with, with bats by the children. You know, even if these things are not observed or, you know, there's no sacred mass or sacred liturgy or sacred customs at your parish, you can still do it in the domestic church. And the great thing is that God has designed this domestic church to be a refuge for the children so that they can still be formed in the faith, even with um, even with difficulties like this that we're dealing with. Um, let me see. Just looking at uh, a few comments. Um, Michael says, what other issues did Vatican II fail to address? I've heard it failed to address the atheism of the clergy as shown by Dr. Chap. Um, I mean, there's Vatican. I'm not really sure exactly what you're referring to from Dr. Chap. Uh, I know Dr. Larry Chap does a lot of good work out there. So um, thank you, Dr. Chap. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, Vatican II didn't address everything, but Dr. Chap is, is one person who says that there was a naivete to a degree in, in uh, Vatican II a naivete about the liberalism of the American empire. Um, and 
however, there are aspects of it that are good um, in um, recovering some of the Eastern fathers. Um, the Eastern European experience of Vatican II was far more positive than the Western European or the American experience. Um, so it's complex. Um, let me see. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for your comments, everybody. And so this has been Benedict. Pope Benedict vindicates the trads. Thanks so much for watching. Um, we'll probably have three or four more shows. We're going to talk more about more um, aspects of the liturgy, mass facing the people, the papal power, um, different aspects of how Pope Benedict's work vindicates the traditional position. Um, so once again, we still need your donations, your support. Please support us at patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic. You can also donate at meaning of Catholic.com. And if you can't afford to be a part of the guild, you can always contact me to get access for free. So let's offer up an Ave to Our Lady of Fatima to ask that our liturgies may be worthy ultimately, because we also have a liturgy of our lives in everything that we do, that we may offer up a pleasing and worthy sacrifice to Almighty God, that um, we can really get to this. Um, you know, I've got one more comment I wanted to address actually uh that's important here gabriel says how can we reconcile the gates of hell will not prevail with the admission that the mass is irrelevant irrelevant um again i'm not sure what you mean by the mass is irrelevant exactly but the the a central the one of the central critical um what the critics of the trads often say is they bring this up and I, Gabriel, I'm not really sure exactly if you're trying to get at that, but I want to try to use this to, um, to address that. And that is the fact that imagine for a moment, imagine a world where all of the fathers of Vatican II and Bunini were all hyper-Orthodox trats, and they went back to their dioceses and they implemented the council. And they were all uber trats. You know, we wouldn't really have a problem. We wouldn't have a problem like we do today. Um, so we can say that a council can totally fail, like Lateran Five did, because people were not pious. People did not repent. There can even be an action of the Holy Spirit that is completely ignored and, and rejected by the people. But God's providence always brings good out of evil. And he can always bring good out of churchmen falling astray. Uh, things that have not done, been done properly because they are corrected very quickly uh, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, irreverent, he says. So Gabriel saying, if the mass is irreverent. Well, um, so for example, the indult allowing the Latin mass was it allowed almost immediately, even by Paul VI. In 1984, the indult was expanded. In 1988, the FSSP was established. So within a generation, this entire issue was being corrected by the Holy Spirit. So we can see that even if there's a critical error made, the Holy Spirit immediately is correcting that. Something that happens within a, a generation, it's like a blink of an eye in church history. You know, something that happens 10 years later, 15 years later, it's immediate. And so we can see the action of the Holy Spirit even in correcting these different missteps by the popes. And again, as I said, there are missteps of the popes before Vatican II. You know, uh, Leo XIII, for example, Raleigh Mont is often cited as a misstep, which prom promoted the Masonic Third Republic of France, which was reversed by Pius X. So it's not, it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't challenge our faith to see missteps by popes that cause errors, that cause problems. Because... The church ultimately is Christ. Christ is in charge of the church. And even if his vicars go astray, he corrects the errors in different ways, whether that's through the next vicar or through the faithful or all different means. Uh, Trad Thomas also has a comment. St. Thomas talks about how our Lord's promise only applies to the fact that the church will not be overcome by heresy, not that it will not have grave times. Yes, um, that's a great comment from uh, Nicholas. The... Um, 
So Gabriel says, so it's not 100% inerrant. Excuse me, but I'm trying to understand. Absolutely. Well, yeah, absolutely, brother. Um, I mean, Vatican I states that, and Gasses Relatio says that the Pope is only inerrant, infallible, when he speaks as cathedra. So in that case, he is 100% inerrant. But there is a distinction between the church and churchmen. The church is the community of all the baptized, the whole church. So, for example, the whole church in Vatican II confirms this doctrine, Lumen Gentium. The whole church, as the census fidelium, cannot fall into error. The whole church, meaning the whole, all of the community of the baptized, everyone, cannot all fall into error. They are infallible according to the census fidelium. But only according to that. That doesn't mean that, you know, all the faithful or most of the faithful in Western Europe could not all fall into heresy. Because then we'd have all the faithful in Eastern Europe who are struggling against communism or what have you. So it does not mean that the church may not fail in a given region or given place or there may not be ter terrible times. Because ultimately we can still see through all these crises that the church has not been overcome by heresy. And the Holy Spirit is working. So for more, Gabriel, I, if you go, if you read my book, City of God versus City of Man, we talk about all the different hard times of the church and how God is always bringing the church out of these crises. He's always bringing the triumph of the church, the triumph of the truth. God allows error to bring about a greater truth. And this is how God brings good out of evil. So I just want to address that because it is an important question. And, and Gabriel, if you want to talk more privately, feel free to contact me, meaningofcatholic.com slash contact. So uh, let's offer up an Ave, again, that our, our liturgy, our liturgy of our whole lives and our hearts may be pleasing and acceptable to God, that Our Lady may cleanse it of all of its impurities, impieties, irreverences, both in our hearts and externally in the liturgy of our lives in the Mass. In nomine Patri, se fidi, spiritu sancti, amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tuum liarabus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre, amen. Our Lady of Victory, pray for us. Saint Joseph, terror of demons, pray for us. Saint Anthony of the Desert, pray for all clergy and seminarians. In nomine Patri, se fidi, et spiritu sancti, amen. Jesus is King.